programs. Welcome back to Drunkards and Dragons. Old Hanker Bernardo here. Let's uh, talk about playing D and D a little bit more better than we used to, but not without something to wet our whistles first. What the hell are we talking about today? What are these setups? What? Why am I center justified? What is this like the the, the web in 1994? Um, no, actually, this is Drunkards and Dragons. This is where we, we talk about the real stuff. This is where we get heavy. Now, I had an internal debate about classifying this video as um, the layer of knowledge. But for one thing, I don't know where the sleeve hat went, the, uh, the tube hat, the hat of knowledge. And also, the more I thought about it, which is this, this whole past week, the more I've been thinking this is actually one of our key mechanics. Now, Hankering, you ask, where the hell are all the key mechanics videos? Well, if there were like... 50 key mechanics, they would just be mechanics. They wouldn't be key mechanics. So there's only a few of these things, and they take months to verbalize. I think we all, as good dungeon masters, utilize these key mechanics, like perception, environment, unspoken um, principles of game design and game mediation? <laughs> Get running games, okay? They're, they're very unspoken, instinctual pillars of how you do D&D to make it fun. So the key mechanics should never be surprising, but they should always be very aha. And anytime you want deeper comprehension of esoteric or complex topics, you have to actively think about those topics. You can't just settle for your instinctive knowledge of the, of the topic. It's, it's not going to do. You need to actively say, I want deeper comprehension. I want to go further. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to think about this. So that's what I've been doing this week. What a rambling, silly intro that was. Terrible. Moral imperative. That's today's key mechanic. Moral imperative. What the hell is moral imperative? Is that, uh, is that Taylor Swift's new album? No, it is not. Let's get into it. Today's key mechanic video is about the moral imperative. Moral imperative is a term mainly coined by and made famous by Immanuel Kant in his writings, including the metaphysics of ethics and others. It is a subset of his concept called the categorical imperative, but moral imperative is easier to understand. It is basically the term that represents how you, as a rational being, are driven toward moral action. Now, what does that mean for the game, and why is this such a key mechanic? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because David Hume, who is another philosopher, his critique of Immanuel Kant's description of moral imperative, which is that our reason alone, our sheer logic and ability to intuit the truth, is what gives us a sense for moral action and, and actually an impetus for moral action. David Hume re rebuked this and actually said that reason alone, pure logic, is not enough to actually incite the will. It takes passion. It takes the, the unspoken moral commitment that we all have. Now, of course, there's a million arguments and countercases for this kind of viewpoint of human behavior, which is like, what about people who have no conscience? What about psychopaths and all these kind of crazy ed outliers? Those kind of countercases are generally not interesting when you're talking about the moral imperative, because we're not looking for reasons to punch holes in a th so-called theory we're more just utilizing a cognitive tool to make our game cooler. So, for the moment, we're going to assume that both David Hume and Immanuel Kant were completely accurate describing and reveling in the concept of the moral imperative. Now, the fundamental concept that you need to understand to get it is that the human mind has access to truth in some regard. Now, exactly what that regard is, Hard to say, we could argue about it for centuries. But some aspect of that access to the truth gives us a sense of what to do. 
Now we have different upbringings, we have different conditioning, we have different life stories that change our preferences and our responses, add all kinds of complexity, but the underlying fact remains, which is that our minds are drawn toward truths, and these truths incite action in our lives, especially when faced with difficult choices. Now often you'll notice that in arguments about moral imperative or about moral impetus or moral decisiveness or moral absolution, some people get highly agitated or irritated that the discussion is happening at all. And Kant describes this situation as uh, the intuitive truth of morality is something that it actually can be very annoying to argue about because you know that it's wrong to blah. And if someone wants to start punching holes in your intuitive knowing that a certain action is the right or wrong thing to do, you become highly irritated very quickly. And to him, this is proof that the rational mind has access to truths which it, it frankly doesn't want to discuss. And later he goes on to get bigger with his commentary that this truth that you feel, this right that you have access to is actually a glimpse into the divine and infinite element of human consciousness. So the moral imperative is a simple code word that we use as smart dungeon masters to take notes in our journal to give a wealth to an adventure moment. That's all this is. So all that stuff, that crazy philosophy crap I just got into, that was all just background, okay? So your job, your training exercise as a dungeon master is to use the term moral imperative in your adventures to describe the moment or circumstances which are going to create memorable stories for people. Because what you're going to do is you're going to play with the fact that they probably know what they should do. That's all it really boils down to. You're going to play with the fact that even somewhat so-called self-designated evil characters are actually played by your friends, and I would seriously doubt that anyone who watches this channel, any of their friends are actually evil. They're probably not involved in D&D. They're probably involved in far more horrible things. Now, they might be mean. They might be a-holes every once in a while, but it does not mean the same as they don't know right from wrong. So you're going to play with the fact that your players have an intuitive sense of the right thing to do. Regardless of alignment, regardless of who their character is, we're, we're going to pull it all up higher than that. And that brings me to the three scenarios that we're going to look at today for moral imperative. Because honestly, if you don't have it in your game, you can get murder hoboism, which is the worst form of D&D, or you can get something even worse, which is boring D&D. Some kind of moral call to action is at the root of every great adventure, every campaign, and every encounter. And if you can have moral imperative in all your work as a dungeon master, it will be spectacular. So even that encounter on the road with the four goblins that jump out of the bushes, if that has a moral context, like we should blah, it's going to be better than just some random encounter because goblins are nasty and you should always behead them. That just there's not there's no content there. I mean my golden lovely. <laughs> mm. Tastes like banana. I got banana in the beer. Moral imperative. The three fundamental cases or manifestations or instances of using moral imperative to make your game cooler. Let's get right into them. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we have the choice. The choice is a mechanic that is used very frequently by a lot of dungeon masters to great effect. Now, the one I have set up right here is the Temple of Light. We're going to use the characters from uh, the Rangers of Numidia, uh, which are Helm, Stills, and Foxy, and of course Zymer, the elderly wizard. In this case, Helm is entering a strange town. Okay, so your players, whoever, is entering a strange town. They're faced with a binary choice that's filled, fraught, you might even say, with scads of moral implications. <laughs> okay, the first encounter is with a somewhat noble character as you approach the Temple of Light. Whatever, substitute all your own content. This noble character, Marl, is uh, selling fruit and bread at a discounted rate for the poor 
outside the, uh, or giving it to children, outside the Temple of Light when Helm walks up. He draws Helm's attention and describes to him a terrible situation in the town where a series of unsavory characters have been terrorizing the town and are seeking to assassinate the head monk, Gorge, who is the head monk of the Temple of Light and one of the only monks remaining. But these unsavory characters, the Green Gang, the Green Gang is beyond the power level of the townsfolk. And actually, the few times that the townsfolk has even remotely tangled with them, they have suffered terrible consequences. These are high-level brigands. But for reasons of supernatural power, they can't enter the Temple of Light themselves to get rid of this final monk and finally take this town over themselves. So they've been looking for help. So Marl, he beseeches you to help him in this search at the peril of all. But perhaps there's a chance someone could survive when the Green Gang was angered if they could overthrow them, if they could end the torment this town faces, right? Okay, great. So Helm says, well, I don't know. I, I really am just here trying to walk down the street. So he walks a bit further here, risking architectural disaster, coming near the front door. Boo! Oops. <laughs> right there. There's Helm interacting with one of the Green Gang members. So he passes up Marl at the discount bread cart and is going past the front door boo, of the Temple of Light and meets one of the Green Gang. Instantly he needs to be taken with the high power level of this character. This brigand is not just some level one schmuck. This is a pretty intimidating little character. A little didn't really fit there. Anyways, back to the choice. The Green Gang member in the shadows near the doorway sees Helm and offers him a thousand gold to assassinate the monk, Gorge, the last surviving monk of the Temple of Light. He's right inside, he's in prayer, there's no one around. It would actually be a pretty easy way to earn a thousand gold. It's no big deal. And, you know, Helm can have whatever conversation he wants with the Green Gang member, you know, why don't you do it yourself? Well, because supernatural power and like, well, hey, this guy over here, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there you go. That's it. That's the entire choice. The rest is up to your player. Now, this is super simple stuff, but there is a rub here that makes it interesting. Now, if there were no reason to do anything but join the townsfolk and defeat the Green Gang, that wouldn't really be a choice that challenges the moral imperative. You have to set it up to where there's a torture element. The torture element here is that the Green Gang member offers a thousand gold, a fine sum, even for high-level players, to go in and do what probably is the wrong thing to do. On the opposite side, if the players sort of rat out the Green Gang, say, hey man, he's right over there, let's get him, or forget it, this guy over here says you're terrorizing his town, Blah! Stab him. They're going to incur a serious, potentially deadly situation and maybe even get all the townspeople killed. So it can't be an easy choice. An easy choice is, do you want to behead the hamster? No. No, I don't. But the hard choice is, well, if you don't behead the hamster, little Timmy over there is going to have his leg broken. <laughs> Or all you have to do is behead this hamster and we're going to pay you 5,000 gold. No problem, right? So you see how the choice works. You can build this into a million scenarios. Do the wrong thing for a huge reward or do the right thing for a potentially terrible situation. Now, you are not looking to tie your players up in knots and torture them with this. What you're looking for is giving them interesting choices because they won't see the situation as binary. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my players almost never play into binary scenarios. If I offer them two choices, they always come up with a third choice. And this is the beauty of utilizing the moral imperative. If these choices were dry and easy, the players don't really need to dig into their own minds to say, well, how can we, how can we win? Because I don't want to do either of these things. If I turn against the green gang, I'm probably going to get everyone in town killed. If I go and kill the monk, I'm never going to be able to live with myself as I spend my thousand gold. But I want to find a way to win. This is like the Captain Kirk mindset, right? There's got to be a way out where we can not only get rid of the gang, we can save the priest, 
okay, well, maybe we could put someone in disguise as the priest and then have him walk down the street and try to get an attempted assassin. No, that's not going to work because we're just still going to make him mad. Maybe we could lure them all into a gulch and drop a bomb in there. I don't know. doesn't matter. This is where players get to take over. You, as the dungeon master, have already done your job. You have offered them a situation which commands the moral imperative to force them to confront this strange and difficult choice. Whether your encounter is going to be a cavern full of myconids and giant mushrooms or a dragon fight at the top of a mountain, you can still utilize this fundamental formula. Take the easy path and probably do the wrong thing and deal with what happens. Or take the difficult path doing what you know is right. You, you probably pretty much already know what you're going to have to do. It's just a matter of how to do it. And then incur more story. Now, you're not doing this to try to make them avoid one choice or the other. As the Dungeon Master, you have to be ready that they choose either path, and you're fine with it. Remember, you're neutral. You're not here to lament when the monk is killed. You're here to go with it and to give them more story track that's laid before them that they can run down. A lot of you guys are doing this in your games. I know it. It's the root of D&D. It's that, and, and I would say combat and sort of discovering mystery are the roots of D&D. So you guys know about how to use the choice. Simple version of moral imperative. Let's get into the other two because they get a little more interesting. Whoa! Second case that you're going to want to use to push the moral imperative. And now this one is going to be much tougher. This one you are probably looking to agonize them a little bit. <laughs> Let's just be honest. All right, this one is called the duty. So first we have, the, I said duty. First we have the choice, then we have the duty. So going again with Immanuel Kant's thoughts on the moral imperative, the word duty is not only hilarious, but very useful because it implies a known should. It implies that you already aware of what you're supposed to do based on instinct, based on logic, based on reason, based on self-preservation, based on morality, based on parental instruction, whatever. But you have a sense of what your duty is in a given situation. A lot of times it's very simple, but every once in a while your duty will be put to the test and that is a moment much like this one right here. So if you look at my second room, we have a short corridor with wooden floors, doorway at the end, and four small grottos or enclaves along the, um, the, the length of the corridor. It's a lot like a sort of cathedral uh, or, or nave architecture, right? So high ceilings, you know, these little enclaves where these strange... Well, we can call them Duragar, why not? These four Duragar in there with these sort of skeletal faces, and they're all chanting. That kind of stuff. Not, not good guy chanting. This is bad guy chanting, right? And they have skull faces, and they're clearly doing like some kind of bad necromancy. Stills, our goblin rogue, who has proved his heroism in combat multiple times, and Foxy the Fox, enter this space. They know they're going through this next door for whatever reason that's been pre predetermined in your adventure. No big deal, right? They just know they have to go through this. But mid-room, on an iron spike in the middle of the room, is none other than Marl. Remember Marl? He's right there. He was the charitable man, giving bread and fruit to children in the street, selling homemade, homemade baked goods at a discount price so the poor could live a better life trying to protect Gorge, the last monk of the Temple of Light. This is a great guy. So at some later point in the story, this very same person is impaled on an iron spike in some kind of ritual space. The party already knows that Marl boo, is a good guy. Matter of fact, one of the best guys in town. And now they've got him skewered on a spike with these four death priests murmuring blasphemous murmurs <laughs> around his body on this corpse or this spike now what needs to be done so they ever so carefully enter the room and they notice immediately that the four necro priests completely ignore their presence they do not care that they're there but then they go up, they do their inspection, they realize, oh my god, that's Marl up there. I couldn't tell from all the blood. That's Marl. They've, 
They've impaled Marl, uh, you bastards! So Stills runs over, says, forget it, stabs one of these priests. The knife is removed and instantly the wound closes and, he's, and is healed. And the priest continues to ignore him and continues, fumbada, fumbada, fumbada. Whoa. So Stills takes a break. He's just like, whoa, what the? Okay, well, screw you. If you're going to ignore me, then I don't even need you. So him and Foxy come over to the Iron Spike and they begin making preparations to bring Marl's body down. Now, Marl is gone, man. He's dead. He's been gutted. This spike is going all the way up his spine out the top of the head. So he is toast. But, yeah, there's your moral imperative right there. Yeah. Right? When you make that sound, that's Immanuel Kant sitting on your shoulder going, see? <laughs> so they start preparing to bring this guy down off the spike. And at that moment, the priests, oh, their aggro is drawn. Blah, 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 blah. They come in, they, they use cone of cold, and they have necro touch and that... that that ghostly wet willy spell. And they come out and they're kicking Still's ass and he has to pull back a little bit. And when he pulls back away from the Iron Spike, they return to their enclaves and continue murmuring. So clearly, they only care about Stills and Foxy when they mess with the corpse of Marl. But they are using the corpse of Marl in some kind of twisted necromancy. It's a necro disco, baby can see the duty. Stills knows it's his duty to get this corpse off this spike. Now, this room I know works great because we just played it in our last session. And uh, it was a few weeks ago, but fantastic. The players could not accept leaving the body up there. They had, even though these, these necro priests are super powerful, almost unkillable, they had to deal with the consequences. There was nothing stopping them from just walking right on through here and walking right out the door. You know, leave old Marl on that spike. He's dead anyway, right? I mean, it's not like he's suffering. It's just a body up there. Sorry. Sorry. The moral imperative does not allow you to do that without later thinking about it and feeling crappy about it. Also, a dungeon master might use it one day against you. He might have undead Marl come, <laughs> come and exact his terrible revenge like in Creep Show or something. Boom! Wait, it's got to hit it just right for disco beer. There it is. So you can see how the duty works. You present the players with a, a, a wrongness, a wrong situation, and all they have to do is walk by. It, it's not even their doing. They didn't even do it. It's just, there it is, the wrong. And all you got to do is just turn the other cheek and walk away, and nothing will befall you. So you can see how this is different than the choice, because the wrong has already happened here. That's the key difference, and you're confronting them with it. If they work to right the wrong, then they're going to pay a terrible price. If they walk right past, it's going to haunt them. And you're thinking, well, that's not much of a punishment. Oh, yes, it is. If as a dungeon master, you don't believe that them just walking past an obviously wrong situation is, is something that is going to haunt and torment them, then your group needs more life. That, that is the very stuff that makes character stories and makes wider stories, even political stories or intrigue stories. So there you go. That's the duty. The duty presents them with an obvious wrong and there's no consequences for walking right on by. Whoa, pretty weird. But you will find that 80% of players, I'm just going to go out there and take a guess, will be unable to pass up the situation. And if they are able to pass up the situation, you need to seriously question the moral fabric of your group, and you need to find a way to put it to the test and refine it, because that is unacceptable. Unless they're working on some higher purpose that's more important, that, that demands that they go past this situation. You don't want weak moral fabric in your group. That is horrible. How, a, how are you going to motivate them? How are the stories going to be heroic and memorable? And what sense of hope or redemption could they ever possibly have in a nihilist universe? None. Necro disco, uh, necro disco. Got the priests keeping me up on the iron spike. Scenario number three, the consequences. Discussions of moral imperative, including those of Immanuel Kant, David Hume, and many others involve the consideration of consequences by the human mind. Human beings have 
an uncanny ability to worry about outcomes. Some say that fear was our first instinct. Some say that fear is our, our most primal instinct, that it drives our behavior the most of all of our emotions. It's a bit of a dismal view, but you can see how a lot of human behavior is built on fear of results or outcomes or consequences. Now, consequences is a big word that comes with a lot of built-in meaning, but outcome is what it really means. What is the outcome of any given action? Now, there's another branch of philosophy called utilitarianism. These are people that believe people only do things out of usefulness to themselves. It's a very dismal sort of philosophy. It doesn't have a lot of poetry to it, and thus its name. Utilitarian would say that morality is only a tool insofar that it's useful for self-preservation or self-advancement. But frankly, I just don't subscribe to that view. I think that the moral imperative is much deeper in us than simple consideration of consequences. And, and this is where the third case becomes interesting. The consequences. So when you're faced with a difficult moral choice, one of the things that's going to make it interesting is sometimes you need to do what locals perceive to be the wrong thing, crime even, to do the right thing. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Something too horrific has occurred and must be avenged despite any outcome or consequences or any wrongdoing that is required for vengeance to be delivered. Sometimes that's yeah, just how it's got to be. When that's the case, there's an interesting opportunity for you if you have the time in your campaign, which is to actually make player or players pay the price for their actions. Now that doesn't mean like they have to pay 5,000 gold or they get beheaded in the square. No, 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 those are just too simple. Timer has deposed an evil ruler, banished him with a spell. Now the town has been freed, but technically speaking, he has committed high treason. And until that sentence is paid out in full, he will be considered a fugitive. And, and, and you've, you've seen uh, situations like this in movies where there is a complex line between good and, and wrong, right and wrong. And sometimes crossing that is the duty of the hero. And then they need to pay the price for it. Those are the consequences. Now you have an interesting situation. If your player has the wherewithal to acknowledge the consequences and pay the price. Normally it is tremendously against the instincts of D&D players to go to the town jail. They can come up with a million ways to escape. They could burn the town to the ground. They could flee in the night. They could all turn invisible. They could summon a rock and fly away into the sky and have legends told about them. But the fact that they can do those things does not change the fact that the most interesting choice they can make is to accept the consequences of those local people, of their traditions and of their laws. Because that is the path of the righteous. And so if they can do that and pay those consequences and come out of those consequences renewed and still strong, they become true heroes. So Zymer has deposed the evil prince Bolak. And for doing this, must spend 10 days in the gulag, okay? The gulag is this terrible isolation cage up on top of these stilts down below uh, the city, the Temple of Light, right? He has to go down there and sit in this cage for 10 days. Now, when it happens, there's probably going to be some mental damage. This is going to be torture. So he's going to basically be tortured with isolation torture for 10 days. He's probably going to forget a few spells. He might even take a stat hit, right? But this, this is the price that you have to pay when you commit high treason. And, and it's just going to give the game a great context. You might even want to make this a separate session. And that's what I've set up here, is you make it a little mini session just for Zymer. So on the one hand, the consequences to me are a case where you present a player with doable consequences or price to be paid for their actions. You, you can't make it so extreme because then they're just going to escape. They're not going to want to, they don't want to have their hand cut off or something like that. But they will undergo something like this that could add to the story. So you've got to watch how crazy your consequences are. But it's a classic, classic moral choice. You have done something that you perceive to be necessary, but it is against local law. You're going to be thrown in jail. 
you clearly have the power to break out of that jail. Do you or don't you? Do you pay the consequences for your actions? That is this final moral imperative case. So that's the question you want to ask as the dungeon master designing an encounter involving imprisonment or, you know, moral unclarity because of law. Now, if you have a paladin in your group or a paladin-themed campaign, the concept of law can become very interesting and can be used to great effect. And this is one way that you do it. Do you willingly pay the price for what you know had to be done but is considered a crime? Now, for my setup over here, I was going to make things fun by uh, having a, a band of magically empowered lizardmen with a grick in their employ and a snake man wizard show up, kill the guards, and Zymer is in this super crazy situation where they're basically going to kill him in the in the cage or maybe they even don't notice him but it gives him sort of an excuse or a reason to rise up to break out of the cage and join the fray and then oh god the town has been overrun by lizard men and here comes Zymer oh man he made it out of the prison but it's too late everything's on fire oh crap you know it was sorry it was dumb of us to put you down there but you let us do it and so you're a stand-up guy in our opinion now let's kick these lizards asses right so that gives a big fun ending to the whole thing rather than him rotting down there for 10 days. They let him out and he's got one less intelligence. <laughs> that wouldn't be cool. Your player didn't get a reward for making a hard choice there. So there you go. Hard choice is a great way to summarize the moral imperative. Give your players hard choices. They're not hard choices because which one should I do, this A or B? They're hard because you know you should do one of them. If you break the law, you know you should probably pay the price or you will be a fugitive there for the foreseeable future. Now maybe being a fugitive is something that's a mere nuisance to you, but I think we can all agree that law is there for a reason, especially in a fantasy world. Law is generally quite huge and absolute. It isn't uh, paperworky and bureaucratic like it is in modern society. Law is a, a a tremendous force for retaining civilized order in an uncivilized world. And so breaking fundamental laws can be the sign really of a brigand or a rogue. And I don't mean rogue like a cool character class, I mean literally like someone you don't want in your town. With the duty, they're going to see through the choices that you're giving. They're going to see that you've created these agonizing situations. but. This is all part of the metagaming fun of D&D. Some of them are going to try to get around it by using character knowledge or character alignment and stuff like that. And that's fine. It's great. That's all part of the story. As long as it doesn't just create a short circuit bypass around moral imperative. And I would argue that any character except maybe chaotic evil characters or savage sort of primal characters like animals have moral imperative in their minds, in their consciousness. And there's no escaping it. And to pretend like it's not there is bad role play and a bad gameplay. Especially if two people at the table are really feeling this moral weight and one of them is just like, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> That's not cool, man. That's not good for group cohesion. And group cohesion is the, the stuff of legend. And then finally we have the choice. This is the simplest version. Right? You can kind of do the, the bad thing, kind of get away scot-free and get a short benefit, no big deal. Or you can get yourself embroiled in a big nasty situation because, ah, damn it, we're going to have to do the right thing again. Crap. But maybe you can think your way around it. Maybe you can come up with something to make this choice work. And that's true of all these. Maybe you can pay the consequences without losing the intelligence point. Maybe you can get the corpse down off the iron spike without having to battle all the almost invincible necro priests, right? But solving that challenge is exactly what room design is all about. It's providing you with a challenge and a puzzle that you don't have to solve, but for the sake of role playing, you will often want to solve. That is the moral imperative. Dungeon mastering, room design, and encounter creation built on higher thinking from classic philosophers of the 19th century. Brrrr. up the new set of adventures. For the group, we're going to end this hiatus pretty soon, next month, and uh, I'm definitely getting the anchor in, so to speak, to get back at the table. Um, it's going to be awesome. We've got a new chapter in our campaign called Kings of Hell. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, please drop a buck in the tip jar. I know it gets tiring to hear it, but click support this channel. Let me try to score some revenue off of this thing and keep going. 
uh, really enjoying doing videos. As always, with my lumpy heads, good to see you guys. Strength, honor, banana beer, and of course, the moral imperative. Boo, boo, boo. Yeah, get out there, give your, your players fascinating moral choices, and uh, give it gravity, man. Give it gravity from hell's heart. I spit at thee.